Welcome to the first day of the new school year at Ozark Christian College. Very early this morning, your alarm clock went off, and my hunch is that you woke up with one thought on your mind. You were thinking, seven o'clock classes are wrong. (laughs) These are not of God. Some of you uh, are freshmen, and it's 10 o'clock now, and some of you at this moment are thinking, why am I here? You have been getting syllabi all morning long, and you are in what is known as syllabi shock. You are suddenly discovering that there is a lot of homework. This is actually college, and maybe you're thinking, why am I here? After all, I have a weird roommate. I'm a long way from home. I'm broke. Why did I come here again? What was I thinking? Maybe you were, you know, thinking, I want to get away from home, or maybe, you know, I want to go be with my friends, I want to get married, you know, why, why did I come? You heard the single girl whose favorite verse was Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, let him. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) you're wondering, is that really a good reason? Why, why am I here? What was I thinking? Here's, here's why I came this morning. I came to tell you why you are here. You are here to learn from Jesus. Did you hear Damien's sermon last night? This is a Jesus school. You are here to learn from Jesus. If you have your Bibles this morning, grab them, crank them open to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. The title of our message this morning is Jesus the Teacher. We're in a series called A Jesus School. Jesus the Teacher. And our text this morning is going to be Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. And while you're turning there, let me just tell you that maybe more than any of the other Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as teacher. Uh, The whole Gospel of Matthew is structured around five major discourses, five uh, lectures, if you will, five teachings from Jesus. And if you have a red-letter edition of the Bible, there's a lot of red letters in the book of Matthew because Jesus is teaching. And right here in uh, Matthew chapter 7, we are at the end of this first discourse. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. We call it a sermon, but you understand Jesus didn't preach it. That's not the verb that's used there. At the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, it says that Jesus went up onto the mountainside. The crowd gathered around. Jesus sat down, traditional posture of a rabbi, and it says he began to teach. Jesus was a teacher. And in this Sermon on the Mount, in this lesson, this lecture, Jesus begins to instruct these people on what life in the kingdom of God would look like. And at the end of of this hour, at the end of this class period, the very last thing, the conclusion to the lecture, Jesus says this, you got your text open, Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. One good teacher can change everything. Helen Keller, six years old, deaf, blind, mute, wild, out of control, overprotected by her parents, spoiled, rotten, until Annie Sullivan arrived. And when Ann Sullivan arrived, this woman who Helen Keller would call teacher for the rest of her life, when this woman was done, Helen Keller could sign. She could read lips with her fingers. She could read Braille. She had actually learned to speak. 
Helen Keller graduated, the first deaf and blind person to graduate from college. She had learned how to speak French, German. She knew Greek. She knew Latin. She went on to write 14 books, hundreds of articles, got an honorary PhD from Harvard. One good teacher can change everything. And maybe you've seen movies like a Dead Poet Society or Mr. Holland's Opus, Stand and Deliver, Dangerous Minds. You know these stories based on true stories, a, a school, students sitting there, no hope, no purpose until a teacher steps into the classroom and their world is turned upside down and they become more than they ever thought they could be. One good teacher can change everything. Now you are blessed with some good teachers here at Ozark Christian College. And for the benefit of our freshmen, I want to introduce you this morning to some of your teachers. I've brought a little thing along with me here. I'm just going to call Meet Your Teachers, all right? Uh, fun facts about a few of our fantastic faculty for our fine freshmen. <laughs> so let me just introduce you. Here's the first one, the guy who's been here the longest, Kenny Bowles, right there. You bet. Kenny Bowles teaches New Testament and Greek. Next slide. He's written commentaries on Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, two books on heaven. Uh, next slide. Here's a fun fact. When I was a student here at Ozark, there was a rumor that Kenny Bowles had never been defeated on the racquetball court. Every year, all-campus racquetball tournament, Kenny always won it. He, in Greek class, could flunk you, and on the racquetball court, could skunk you. He was good, all right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and... Next uh, slide there, one last thing you need to know about him. He has the spiritual gift of sarcasm, all right? <laughs> so like, you know, Dr. House off of TV, House? Yeah, like if he became a Christian, he would be Kenny Bowles. Are you following me here? <laughs> so this is Kenny Bowles. Next one, next one here. Uh, Shane Wood, Shane Wood, very good. <laughs> teaches Christian Life class, teaches several New Testament classes for us here at Ozark. Uh, next slide there, Shane is uh, finishing his PhD on the book of Revelation, University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He's going to finish that up this fall. A uh, fun fact, this summer, uh, Shane and his wife Sarah adopted a new little baby, little Robert John from the island of St. Vincent. Very, very cool uh, to join their other kids. Uh, Maddox the bounty hunter there too. And uh, uh, one more fun fact about Shane. Shane does, in fact, have the longest hair of any male faculty member and at least twice in his life has been mistaken for a homeless guy, all right? That's pretty cool, all right? Next one, how about Jessica Sherman? She, you bet. Teaches English comp for us here, study skills, oversees our learning center, a great resource, by the way. Next slide. When she was in graduate school, she was a member of Phi Kappa Phi, which is the oldest and most selective honor society in the nation. So she's smart, but she also understands college students because, next slide there, she served as a dorm mom in Goodman for five years. That is right. Uh, last fun fact there, she also must love her husband, Ryan, dearly because she changed her last name to Sherman from her maiden name of McCool. <laughs> Jessica McCool. If that is not the sweetest last name in the world, I do not know what is, all right? She must love him a lot. Wonderful lady. How about uh, Dr. Bolin, Terry Bolin, all right? Back with us, you bet. <laughs> Teaches New Testament classes, personal evangelism, philosophy. Uh, next slide there. He's just returning to us from a year-long sabbatical, uh, during which he was teaching at Livingstone International University in Uganda. You should get him to tell the stories. Very cool. Uh, next fun fact about Dr. Bolin. This summer, he won a gold medal in powerlifting at the Show Me State Games. I'm not making that up. Dude is strong, all right? He's a beast. Last uh, little fact there. If you know Terry Bolin, he has a deep voice just like God. And he is an avid St. Louis Cardinals fan, just like God, all right? Thank you very much. All right, one more, one more. Let me introduce you to one more of your teachers. Jesus. You bet. Now, you are blessed with an amazing faculty at this school. I personally have studied at four colleges. I have uh, visited dozens more. I can tell you I do not know of a greater group of men and women, more godly, people who know their stuff, they care about their students, their academics, but they're practitioners. They communicate passionately and creatively. And you 
I hope a day does not go by where you do not count yourself blessed to sit under these men and women. But what you need to know is this, that at the end of the day, this is not a Kenny Bull school, school, it is not a Shane Wood school, it is not a Chris Duell or a Doug Aldridge school. This is a Jesus school. In every class, he is your teacher. Because that is who we are here at Ozark Christian College. You know the statue that uh, resides there on the porch of the library, and I know you like to call it Scary Jesus. I know that. <laughs> And yes, if you're returning your books late at night, he will scare the bejesus out of you right there, I'm telling you. <laughs> but the actual name of that statue, the, the, the real title of that statue is Christ Teaching. And that is why behind him on the wall is that verse from Matthew chapter 11 where Jesus says, come learn from me. That statue is there to remind you that you are here to learn from Jesus. Now, one good teacher can change everything. And Jesus is the greatest teacher in the world. Yes, he came to give his life as a ransom for many. Yes, he came to die for our sins. Yes, his whole life was directed toward Calvary. But you need to know that Jesus was a teacher that Jesus, when he was teaching, he wasn't just passing the time until his crucifixion. It's not like his teaching was this optional, dispensable part of his ministry. When he was teaching, you know, he's not just treading water until Good Friday. His teaching was central to why he came. Because Jesus wanted to instruct us in how to live in the kingdom of God. He wanted us to understand what, what a healthy, uh, a holy human life would really look like. He wanted to guide us and, and to, to show us the shape of the way things really are in this world. He wanted to map out for us the furniture of reality so that we wouldn't keep banging our shins in the dark on truths that we did not even know were there. And Jesus came to educate us. He came to train us. He came to tutor us. And so we are called not just to accept him as our savior, we are called to accept Jesus as our teacher. And that means that we hear him and that we believe him. And did you hear the text that we read? It means that we put into practice what we learn. That's, the, that's our text. Now that's the really hard part, isn't it? It's not just hearing him these words of mine, but putting them into practice. This was um, back many years ago. I used to teach a class on the book of James, General Epistles class here at Ozark. And uh, it, was, uh, it was about this time of year. It was the beginning of the school year. We were just a week or two in. It was a Friday, and uh, it had been a long week. I was exhausted. It was Friday, 5 o'clock. I was driving home into my driveway. I'm kind of an introvert, and so I was ready to be away from people, and I was just exhausted. I want to go in, sit down in my recliner, chill out for you know, Friday evening, watch a movie with my family, do something like that. But as soon as I pull in Friday uh, into the driveway, my wife, uh, Katie, um, meets me at the door and she says, hey, she says, I want you to run these, these coin jars over to Velma. Now, my wife had put this challenge out to all the kids in our church. We were going to collect a missionary offering, so we had these big jars. Bring all the change in your house for the missionaries. So the kids had filled these, all these jars with, I mean, just boatloads of, of coins, change. And Velma was this elderly widow in our church, been part of our church for a long time, wonderful servant of the Lord, but now she was a shut-in. And she couldn't come to church. She couldn't do stuff at church anymore, but she had volunteered. She said, hey, even though I'm stuck here at home, I can count all the coins in the jars. Long, tedious thing, but she was kind of really looking forward to doing that. It was a great idea. But it was Friday, and I was tired, and I'll be honest, I thought to myself, man, I don't really want to go over there, because, um, you know, can I do that later? But I thought, okay, all right, I should, I should go take the coins over there, but I'm, I'm just going to run in and run out. I'm not going to get caught in a long conversation. And so I'm picking up these big coin jars, and that's when Katie says to me, she says, oh, 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 and by the way, take the girls with you. Velma will be glad to see them. Now, our daughters, uh, Lydia and Claire at the time, they were like six and three, and they were just super cute little girls, and my daughter Lydia is a born performer, and she sings and dances and tells jokes, and I'm sure that, yes, she would have totally lit up Velma's evening, and what would have happened is we would have been stuck there for like another hour or two, and so I'm thinking to myself, I, I don't, I'm just tired, I just don't want to do that, and so I said, no, I'm not going to take the girls, let me just run over there, I'll take the coins to her, and we'll go visit her another time, and she said, no. Uh, Katie said, I want you to take the girls over there. Velma is lonely, and she will enjoy that visit. And I said, no, I am tired, and I'm not going to take the girls over there. And she said, oh, yes, you are. And I said, oh, no, I am not. All right. And so as I was buckling the girls into the car, 
<laughs> I was grumbling, man. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, clicking their car seats here, and I'm slamming the car door, and I'm driving down the road, I'm grumbling under my breath, taking my wife's name in vain. <laughs> and I'm driving down Main Street, and I can still remember, it's right about Main and 12th. I know exactly where this happens. Um, Jesus, the teacher, decided to have a little lesson. And he flashed up onto the screen of my mind this verse that I had memorized, uh, James chapter one, verse 27. The religion that God our Father sees as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And Jesus the teacher kind of whispered in my ear at that moment, how you doing with that one? And you want to know the irony, okay? I told you I taught general epistles class. I had lectured that morning on James 1, 27. I could parse it in the Greek, but I was missing a chance to obey it. And I don't know what the Greek word for knucklehead is, (laughs) but whatever it is, Jesus kind of made me realize that was me at that moment. Because if I'm truly going to accept Jesus as a teacher, it is not enough just to, listen, one of the great temptations that you face here at a Bible college is to hear the words of Jesus and study the words of Jesus and outline the words of Jesus and translate them and parse them and memorize them and teach them and preach them and not live them. Jesus says whoever puts them into practice, that is the wise man. That's the one who can call me teacher. And so my question is very simple to you this morning. My question is just this. Will you trust Jesus enough as your teacher to obey him? Will you accept him as your teacher? Will you trust Jesus enough to actually do what he says? Now, for some of you, this is your first time to ever be enrolled in a Jesus school. And so what I want to do in just the minutes that I have left here is I want to I just want to tell you, before you answer that question, will you trust him enough as your teacher to obey him? Before you answer that, let me just tell you what Jesus is like as a teacher. First thing that you'll notice about Jesus as a teacher is this. Jesus is completely brilliant. Now, we don't always think about Jesus this particular way. When you hear the name Jesus, maybe you think of words like loving, holy, powerful, he's nice, he's kind, he's miraculous, yes. But does the the word uh, genius ever pop into your head? We don't always think of Jesus like this, but you need to understand that the people who met him thought of him like that. Think about the very first time that we ever meet talking Jesus in the Gospels, all right? When he's 12, it's the first time Jesus ever speaks. You remember this? He gets left behind in Jerusalem, and he's stuck there in the temple, and then when his parents find him, he's sitting there, and he's talking with the teachers of the law. You understand these guys had PhDs in theology and Bible, and Jesus is in this conversation with them, 12 years old, and he is confounding them. I mean, they're just throwing these questions at him, and Jesus is just like, foo, 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 he's, you know, he's answering all these questions, and then he's zapping these questions back at him, and they can't answer them. It's like scripture kung fu, and Jesus is like Bruce Lee. All right. I mean, he is undefeated. You cannot stop him intellectually. They just don't know what to do with this kid. He's 12 years old, and he's, he's totally, I mean, he's, he's just brilliant. I've never met a kid like this. And, and it reminds me of the true story, true story. Uh, about a, uh, there's a college student named Niels at the University of Copenhagen. This was several years ago. And he was uh, in physics class taking a test, question on the physics test. Describe how to determine the height of a skyscraper using a barometer. Well, Niels wrote on the test, this was his answer, tie a long piece of string to the neck of the barometer. Lower the barometer from the roof of the skyscraper to the ground. The length of the string plus the length of the barometer will equal the height of the building. <laughs> hey, pretty clever answer, I thought. But professor didn't think so, flunked him. Niels appealed to the academic committee there at the university, true story. And, and he said, hey, my answer was, was correct. And so the university appoints this, this panel of professors to decide uh, this particular dispute. The panel decides, yes, technically his answer was correct, but it doesn't display any knowledge of physics. And so here was their solution. They were going to call Niels in. They were going to give him five minutes, a brief oral exam, to answer the question in some way that displayed a knowledge of physics. So they call Neil in before this pa- Niels in before this panel of professors. They give him five minutes. For three minutes, he sits there in silence. His brow is furrowed in thought. Eventually, you know, the panel members say, hey, you know, your time is running out. Do do you have an answer? 
And Neil said, oh, actually, I have several answers. I, I just can't make up my mind which one to use. He says, how to determine the height of a skyscraper using a barometer? He says, well, number one, he said, you could take the barometer up to the roof of the skyscraper, drop it over the edge, measure the time it takes to reach the ground. The height of the building could then be worked out with the formula H equals 0.5G times T squared. But that's bad on the barometer. So, number two, if the sun is shining, you could measure the height of the barometer and then set it on end and measure the length of its shadow. Then you could measure the length of the skyscraper's shadow. And then it is a simple matter of proportional arithmetic to work out the height of the skyscraper. Or, number three, if you wanted to be highly scientific about it, you could tie a short string onto the barometer and swing it like a pendulum, first at ground level and then on the roof of the skyscraper. The height would be worked out by the difference in the gravitational restoring force using the formula T equals 2 pi square root times L slash G. Or, number four, if the skyscraper has a staircase inside, it would be easier to walk up it and mark off the height of the skyscraper in barometer lengths and then add them up. <laughs> or number five, if you really wanted to be boring and orthodox about it, of course you could use the barometer to measure the air pressure on the roof of the skyscraper and on the ground and convert the difference in millibars in feet to give the height of the building. But, he says, since we are constantly being exhorted to exercise independence of mind and apply scientific methods, I think number six is the best way. I would walk into the skyscraper, knock on the janitor's door, and say to him, if you will tell me the height of this skyscraper, I will give you a nice new barometer. <laughs> <laughs> that student's name was Niels Bohr, who ultimately went on to win the Nobel Prize in physics. He was a brilliant young man, and when he walked out of that room, you can be sure that all of those professors were shaking their head and thinking, who is this kid? That's, that's what the teachers of the law did with Jesus at age 12, and he walks out, and for the rest of his ministry, he just left people confounded, dumbfounded, astounded. He was brilliant, and sometimes we just, we forget his sheer intellectual stature, and that is a huge mistake because listen, it's not just in matters of scripture you understand. Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 says all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Dallas Willard puts it this way. He says that Jesus has complete cognitive mastery of every phase of reality. Physical, moral, spiritual, everything. Think about this. Jesus, Jesus knew how to transform the molecular structure of water to make it wine. When he fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, that means that Jesus knew the scientific equation for creating more matter from energy. Jesus knows the medical formula for how to transform the tissues of the human body from sickness to health. He knows the scientific secrets for suspending gravity, interrupting weather patterns. He would make Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein, and Stephen Hawking look like kindergartners. He is quite literally the smartest man who has ever lived. Have you seen The Princess Bride? then you will know the line. Let me put it this way. You've heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? Morons. <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have said that, but he could have, you understand. Because Jesus understood things that the great philosophers and ethicists and moral teachers in history would never understand. Things about human nature and human heart and the nature of reality. And that's why, listen, listen, listen. If you, if you choose not to follow Jesus' teaching, things will not go well with you. Because Jesus is always right. Sin is not just wrong, it's dumb, okay? It, it's like trying to swim upstream against reality. It's like sawing against the grain of the universe. You will get splinters. It will not go well with you. I mean, just take the Sermon on the Mount here, for example. Let's say, you know, Jesus said, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. But let's say that I'm sitting here in a class at Ozark, and I'm asked to give a reading confessional for a book, and... Even though I only read 50%, I write down 100%. Now, I do that in order to get a good grade and win applause and get a degree, but because I know I cheated, that grade and that applause and that decree are robbed of whatever fulfillment and meaning they might have had, and disobeying Jesus doesn't work. Or let's say that somebody hurts me. They do me wrong. And instead of following Jesus' teaching in Matthew 18, forgive your brother 70 times 7, instead I decide, man, it's just, I think it's going to feel better to hold on to that bitterness and stay angry at that person. But if I do, when I hold on to that bitterness, somebody said it's like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. That acid will just eat you, eat you out. 
from the inside. And disobeying the teaching of Jesus won't work. Or suppose I'm feeling lonely and I want a little, a little shot of pleasure because I think it will make me feel better. And so I decide to ignore Jesus' teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not looking lustfully at a woman and I click on a pornographic website. But instead of making me feel connected and wanted and good, ultimately I will be left feeling empty and isolated and shameful. And it's not just wrong, it's dumb. It doesn't work. It's like trying to satisfy your thirst by drinking salt water. It will never satisfy. And Jesus doesn't just tell us all of these things. We don't have all these red letters. We don't have the whole Bible because Jesus is on this power trip and he just wants to see if he'll do this stuff because he said it. No, he tells us this stuff because he's really, really smart and he knows how things work and he doesn't want us to wreck our life on the reefs of reality. And listen, you will only be committed to Jesus. Let me say that again. You will only be committed to Jesus if you believe that he knows stuff. That he understands the truth about your life and the truth about the universe. If you are not convinced that Jesus is the most intellectually competent person in the world, if you are still somewhere harboring some small thought that Jesus might be the slightest bit wrong here, maybe he's just a little bit uninformed over there, you will never really fully trust him. Part of the foundation of faith is recognizing that Jesus is completely brilliant. Now that is hard because of number two. The second thing you'll notice about Jesus the teacher is this. His teacher, his teaching is almost always counterintuitive. Jesus is the upside down teacher. Sermon on the Mount, how does it start? Who are the lucky ones, who are the fortunate ones, the blessed ones in the world? Are they the strong, the wealthy, the well-fed, the people for whom all things are going right? No. Jesus says, you wanna know who's really fortunate? The really fortunate people are the rejects, the weak, the hungry, the poor, the ones who are crying because everything in their life is going wrong. What? <laughs> Jesus, that doesn't make any sense. That's, that's, that's backwards, that's upside down. Jesus, Jesus was the greatest deviation from the norm in all history, all right? He was completely not conventional. And when Jesus would teach, he would say things like this. God, you know what God is like? He's like a good shepherd who risks the survival of 99 sheep by leaving them out here in the wilderness where they might die to go save one lost little sheep. He is like a father who throws a lavish party for the rebellious son who squandered the family fortune. He is like an employer who pays the exact same wages to the guys who came in at the last minute that he does to the guys who worked all day. He is like a king who washes the feet of his underlings. Jesus left normal in the dust. He was completely counterintuitive, and everything he did at first blush doesn't make sense. And the question will be, will you trust Jesus as your teacher because what he says will sound weird. He will say things like, you want to know the way up? It's down. The way first is last. The way of success? Service. You want to get? Give. You want to be strong? Be weak. You want to get the most out of life? Go to where the least are. You want to discover yourself? Forget yourself. You want freedom? Give control to God. You want honor? Be humble. You want to get even with your enemies? Bless them. You want to live? Die. And you just read, and you just go, that doesn't make any sense. Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching. When someone hits you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. And the people are listening are going, Jesus, no way. Yahweh. And he says, go the second mile and give the spare coat and live without anger and lay your life down and bless those who curse you and pray for those who persecute you. And I'm telling you, I know this is way outside the lines. I know it's turning the wisdom of the world on its head, but it will work. Will you trust him? I am a child of the 80s, which was a great decade. Atari, Rubik's Cube, parachute pants, mullets. Michael Jackson was still black. It was, it was good. It was, it was good. <laughs> And one of my favorite 80s movies, Karate Kid. 
Now, if you've seen the original Karate Kid, you know the story. Daniel LaRusso is this kid who moves into a new uh, neighborhood, and he's getting beat up by this big group of bullies, and so he goes to the gardener's apartment complex named Mr. Miyagi and asks Mr. Miyagi to teach him karate, and Mr. Miyagi agrees. He says, but I teach, you learn, no questions. Deal? daniel San says, deal. And so he shows up the next Saturday morning, first thing in the morning, and uh, he's ready to learn karate. But instead, Mr. Miyagi says, oh, a wax of cars. And Mr. Miyagi got like 20 cars. And so all day long, you know, and Mr. Miyagi's real picky about how his cars, you know, he, he has to use this motion, a wax on, a wax off. And so he's got to do all these cars, wax on, wax off. And all day long, he just exhausts himself. And so fine, he comes back the next Saturday morning. Early in the morning, he's ready. Finally, this time he's going to learn karate. But no, this time Mr. Miyagi says, ah, oh, Send a deck. And he's got all kinds of deck. I mean, wooden deck everywhere. And he's, again, he's real picky about these big circular motions he's supposed to use to send the deck. And Daniel's son, he's, he's confused. He starts to ask this question. And Miyagi goes, oh, 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 no questions. And so all day long, he sends the deck. And the next Saturday, he comes back. And finally, he's going to learn about karate. But no, this time, Mr. Miyagi says, I'll paint the fence. And he has a, you know, specific motions he's supposed to use to paint the fence. And so all day long he paints the fence and Miyagi's gone all day. And finally at the end of the day, Daniel's exhausted and Miyagi comes back into the courtyard and he's got a fishing pole over his, over his shoulder. He's got fish and Daniel just loses it. He blows up. He's like, you've been fishing all day. Why don't you tell me you've been fishing? And Mr. Miyagi says, oh, you busy training karate? He says, I haven't been training nothing. I haven't been learning any karate. All I've been as, been as your slave. And Mr. Miyagi says, oh, everything is not as it seems. He says, well, I, I, no, I haven't learned any karate. You ain't teaching me nothing. You're not keeping your part of the deal. I quit. And daniel son starts walking away. And Mr. Miyagi says, daniel son, come here. <laughs> so daniel son, I mean, that wakes him up. So he comes back, but he's still, you know, slouching. He's like, daniel son, show me a wax on. So Daniel kind of half-heartedly does the motion. He says, no, show me wax on. So he does it. Now show me a wax off. Show me, send a dick. Show me, paint the fence. And then Mr. Miyagi takes a step back. He says, daniel son, wax on. And all of a sudden, Mr. Miyagi, he punches right at Daniel. But Daniel instinctively does the wax on motion. And he blocks the punch. And Mr. Miyagi punches him again. And he does the wax off motion. And he blocks that punch. And all of a sudden, Mr. Miyagi just goes off, and he's hitting and punching and kicking. And, I mean, Daniel's son, he's waxing on, waxing off. He's sending the deck. He's painting the fence. He blocks everyone. I was 13 years old. I about peed my pants at that moment. I was like, that is awesome. Oh, that is so cool. I'm telling you what. And all of us in the audience, all of a sudden, we realize what Daniel has just realized, and that is he has been in training the whole time. And listen, even though Mr. Miyagi's directions, even though they didn't make any sense, all of a sudden, daniel son realized that Mr. Miyagi wasn't crazy. Mr. Miyagi knew what he was doing. He was right all along. Now hear me. Will you trust Jesus? As counterintuitive as it is, we trust him enough to put his word into practice. When someone hurts you, instead of holding on to that bitterness, will you choose to forgive that person? If you do, you will know the joy, hopefully, of a restored relationship. At the very least, you will know the joy of a clean conscience. And what you will discover is that Jesus was right all along. And Jesus says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And when the offering plate comes around, when you decide to give your money instead of hoarding it, you will discover the joy of a generous heart. And the next time that I'm telling a story to somebody and I'm tempted to embellish it a little bit to make myself look like a hero, I remember, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And I just tell the story plainly and simply and honestly. And I know the joy of telling the truth, and I discover that Jesus was really right all along. One good teacher can change everything, and if you will put into practice the words of Jesus, you will discover he was right, and it will change your life. But let me close with this. It won't just change your life. Jesus' teaching will change the world. 
His teaching is nothing less than world changing. Yes, he sounded crazy, but Jesus, Jesus was actually the only sane person in a crazy world. And if you listen to Jesus long enough, you discover that he was hearing music that nobody else did. And you discover that there is a vision of a whole different kind of life. And throughout history, when people have caught that vision, when they have listened to his teaching, and they have actually done what he said, they have discovered that there is this whole new kind of life that could actually change the world. I read a fascinating book this summer by John Ortberg called Who Is This Man? The Unpredictable Impact of an Inescapable Jesus. And in that book, in chapter after chapter, he just shows how in one sphere of life after another sphere of life, the teaching of Jesus has transformed everything. A seminary student, civil rights, Martin Luther King, bothered by discrimination but doesn't know what to do until he comes across the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, nonviolent resistance. Where did Gandhi get those? From the teachings of Jesus. And everything changes. And the dignity of human life. In the Roman Empire, life was held so cheap that gladiators fought to the death and that was the NFL of the Roman Empire. People saw killing other people as entertainment. And how did that change? Because of one little monk named Telemachus who actually gave his life to stop a gladiatorial contest. And the people were so sobered by that that the emperor declared the gladiator contests dead and everything changed. And where did the idea come from that, that women have dignity and equality and value? Where did the idea come from that slavery is wrong and that one human should never, should never own another human as property? Where did the idea come from that, that sick people like lepers shouldn't be isolated and rejected but should be cared for and hospitals should be built? Where did all those ideas come from? They weren't out there in the world. They all trace back to Jesus. And one last example the very idea that there is a God who is personal and who loves you. Where did that idea come from? That idea was not in the ancient world. Their gods were impersonal and they were, they were far removed and they often weren't even good guys. And it was Aristotle himself once who wrote, he wrote this. He said, it would be eccentric to claim to love Zeus. Nobody in the ancient world was, you know, singing, Zeus loves me, this I know, for the Iliad tells me so, all right? That, that wasn't happening, all right? Where did, that, where did that idea come from? That there is a God that we can know and a God who loves us. That idea can be traced back to the teaching of Jesus. Last story. Two weeks ago, I was uh, teaching in children's church, and I was uh, teaching on how God loves us. God loves all people. And uh, I was talking to the kids in children's church about the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children of the World, Red and Yellow, Black and White, They Are Precious in His Sight. And, and, uh, and I pulled out my phone, and, and I, just, I just showed them uh, this, this picture. And I was telling him, I said, this summer my son Luke went to Africa and he was there for two months and, and he got to meet lots of kids over there and they're very different from us. They live in a different place, they have different color skin, they're on the other side of the world. But God loves those kids just as much as he loves my son Luke, just as much as he loves you. God loves all of us. And so I'm, I'm showing that picture around to all the kids. I'm walking around the big circle there in children's church and one little boy, Gavin, five years old, he looks at my phone, he looks at that picture and he says, now... Which one of those is your son? <laughs> <laughs> the big white one in the middle, all right? <laughs> and listen, even the world around us, they have a song like that of their own. Jesus, they call it, It's a Small World After All. And it's this idea that all the peoples of the world, all ethnicities, all nationalities, genders and social status and all that we all could somehow be gathered together as one big family. Where did that idea come from? That, there was no community like that in the ancient world. There wasn't even the idea of a community like that in the ancient world. That all goes back to Jesus. And when you read the book of Acts, you discover that that one idea, that God loves us, 
And that God wants to know us and build this community, this kingdom of all kinds of people to love them and transform them. You read the book of Acts and you discover that that idea, that thing called the church, turned the world upside down. And all because one carpenter in a backwoods province of the Roman Empire who never wrote a book, never went to school, never traveled more than 100 miles from where he was born, sat down and began to teach. Acts chapter 4 says that Peter and John, these men, these apostles who had turned the world upside down, were ordinary, unschooled men. But it says their opponents took note as they were astounded that they had been with Jesus. They were graduates of the Jesus School. So this morning, will you accept Jesus as your teacher? Not just hear him, not just believe that he is right, but will you do what he says? If you do, he might just change everything. Let's pray. Father God, Teach us this year, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.